Not a matter of if, but when crisis will rock your world. I'm Roshini Rajkumar, crisis strategist, licensed attorney, and host of The Crisis Files. In each case file, we explore a real world crisis. My crisis squad and I look for solutions. I also turn to people who work from the inside to improve the world around us. Today, that person is Tammy Lee. She is CEO of Our Rescue, an organization that leads the fight against child sexual exploitation and human trafficking worldwide. Latest United Nations stats show there are 49.6 million people in modern slavery worldwide. 35% of them are children. Tammy is here for the case file I call Women and Children for Sale. Tammy, if there was ever a topic for the crisis files. It is this one. These numbers are just astounding. They're staggering. And the fact is we in the United States, particularly men in the United States, are the largest consumers of sex trafficking in the world. So it's not just happening in the dark alleys of Mexico or Bangkok. It's happening right here in our own backyard. In fact, sex trafficking is the most common type of trafficking in the U.S. Child sex trafficking has been reported in all 50 states. And here's a number that I just couldn't believe when your team sent it to me. Human trafficking is a $150 billion industry, the second most profitable illegal industry in the U.S. It is shocking. So sex trafficking, human trafficking, labor trafficking, only just behind drugs and drug trafficking. And so you think about what's happening with people. Drugs are something that you consume one time and they're done. With women and children, you can consume them over and over and over again. So let me understand the pipeline. How does this even start? We hear about ports and other places, big malls. Give us kind of more of that behind the scenes, how this even gets moving. So it happens differently in different countries. In some countries, sometimes children are literally lured into a situation and then taken. In the U.S., it's oftentimes people that are runaways, that are taken advantage of and exploited, where they're looking for their next meal, they're looking for their next place to stay at night, and they get into this vicious cycle where they're dependent on their traffickers for their very livelihood, for food and shelter. Wow. So would you say in the U.S. there's a higher percentage of people in this trade that are runaways, or it's one of the categories of people? It's one of the categories of people, too. Going to a different category, we look at missing and murdered Indigenous women. Another large category where I don't even know what those numbers are because we really don't have any transparency around that. But we do know in places like Western North Dakota— near the oil fields that are also close to some of the Indian reservations, that a lot of trafficking is happening there. And I'm not sure if they are taken or if they are invited and then kept. We don't have a lot of transparency around what's happening there, but that's an area that I really want to get to the bottom of and helping to solve that problem. Absolutely. So you have teams in the U.S. Our rescue also has teams Survivor care members in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, Latin America, Mexico, the Caribbean. This is a global problem. How do your teams help? Give us a vision on that. So I think what you saw or others saw in movies like Sound of Freedom is a very almost dramatized view of how we rescue victims of human trafficking, where you go in and you kick down walls and you do like a Navy SEAL or FBI ops kind of deal. How we actually do the rescues is we partner with law enforcement. So we give them the tools and the technology that they need to do digital forensics and to make the arrest. And we are expert in cyber ops and cyber crimes. And that's where we really build the evidence in the case so that they can go in and not only make the rescue of the survivors, but make the arrest and beyond that, make the prosecution. So taking the traffickers off the streets and putting them behind bars for the rest of their lives. That's how you stop the supply and demand cycle that we're in with human trafficking. And when we talk about the traffickers, are we talking about teams of people? Are we talking about sort of like I think of the mafia, there's the boss, the crime boss, and then the people below him or her? Again, that kind of varies by region and by city. Sometimes and oftentimes it is a one-person operation. 
in our rescue talk about the one and saving the one. So sometimes we go in and make big arrests that are arrests of like a dozen people and 20 women and children that are being trafficked. But our day-to-day work is really about the one. And I should mention, if anybody has a trigger issue with child sexual exploitation, they might want to stop listening to the podcast at this point. But for the one, here's an example of an arrest that we made just a couple of months ago. It was a father who was bragging about sexually abusing his 10-year-old daughter. And he was on the dark web, and he sold basically tickets to be able to watch this online. Our rescuers will go in and monitor these chats and try and pick up enough digital forensic evidence to be able to make the arrest. And how they do that is through what we call OSINT, open source intelligence. So we might see a purple pillowcase in the background. We might see a certain type of tile on the floor. We might see pajamas that have a unicorn on them or a distinguishing mark on the child. And through watching some of these and figuring out where that person is, we use open source intelligence. So there might be a Facebook post or a family member is a Facebook post that shows some of those things in it. So we can make enough matches to go in and do the arrest. And then we collect the evidence and we make the prosecution. Wow. And I love, though, that you're saying we sometimes have to think of the one, Mm -hmm. because each time you can save one, you've really saved a life. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And you think about these childhood trauma victims or women and adult childhood trauma victims. This stays with you for life. And so when we make the arrest, at the same time, we send in our survivor care teams, which are on the ground. And in this case, what's really interesting is the 10-year-old might not know that she is a victim. This is her father. This is somebody that she trusts. So we try and make sure that the arrest happens when she is at school so she doesn't get double traumatized by seeing her father taken away in handcuffs and not understanding what's happening here. And then immediately getting her right into survivor care, which for her is likely to be a lifelong journey with us. Right, which is really the the sad story. There's there's hope in that you saved her, but then the aftermath of that right goes on for decades. How can people out there who are not part of this negative criminal pipeline, how can the rest of us help? There are so many ways that you can help by supporting your local law enforcement by every time you fly through the MSP airport and you see the back of the bathroom doors and the signs in the airport, if you see something, say something. This is something that a lot of us don't want to see because once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Having the courage to be on the lookout really is how we can all help. And there are national tip lines, but I will tell you those tip lines are just inundated with people. So you're more likely to get a response by calling your local law enforcement or even reporting it in the moment to airport police so that if they see something, they can go to the gate and actually look for it. Another way that we're working on this is deepening our partnership with law enforcement within the airports to kind of stop it as these women and children are being transited. What are some of the things we're looking for, Tammy? We're looking for things like relationships that don't look normal. I'm not talking a grandfather with a grandchild, which you would see that sort of loving relationship. We're talking about people that do not look like they're matched. And not all traffickers look like criminals, by the way, either. You might have a trafficker that's in an Armani suit with a woman who's well-dressed, but it's really picking up on those nonverbal cues and body language and looking to see Do these people seem like they should be together? And what other clues can I pick up on? Does she have her own cell phone in her hand as she's walking through the airport, which all of us have our cell phones in our hand? Or does he have her cell phone in his pocket? Interesting. So it's those subtle little things that we are not trained to look for. But once you're aware of them, you're suddenly part of our mission, which is rescuing these survivors and arresting their traffickers. So there is really no day that's the same for you and your team at Our Rescue. That's right, because we do things differently in different geographies. In the U.S., we do less of the actual rescue where we go in and more of the cyber ops and support. And in the U.S. and actually around the world, we have this amazing feel-good story, which is our canine unit. We train canines 
to be electronic storage device detection dogs. And by that, I mean your cell phone has a chip in it that is sprayed with a special coating that dogs can smell. Anything that is a, a USB piece of equipment or a flash drive has that on it. Even the tiniest little chip, which some traffickers will carry on their keychains, they can smell that. So after an arrest has happened, we send in the secondary force, which is the canine and their handlers, to gather additional evidence. And it might be in a ceiling tile. It might be tucked in a secret compartment in a wall. It might be in a book that has a piece cut out of it so they can put their iPhone in there. And in one case, the trafficker saw the police coming through the front door, so he ran out the back door and he threw his iPhone in a koi pond, which was three feet deep. The dog was able to walk to that four hours after the arrest and still smell that ESD scent underwater. In the phone. In the phone, which is amazing. So the dogs are a way of making this less of a scary topic for people to talk about. So when we go into schools or fundraising events, we bring the canines. And the canines are also amazing for law enforcement and for the survivors because you think about what these law enforcement rescuers have gone through as they go in to rescue these women and children. They, too, are traumatized. They, too, need care. And the dogs immediately know that. They can sense in you. You've got dogs. You've got love, beautiful dogs. Love and dogs. And, I mean, you know how dogs are, are more sensitive than oftentimes humans are. Yes. They're so loving and so unconditional. Mm -hmm. right, in their expression toward humans, for sure. I always try to find some lining of hope in all of our episodes on The Crisis Files. You have shared some very graphic details, some very unsavory details about this side of our world, which we have to hear so that we could try to start turning it around. Are you finding hope? Have any of the numbers gone down in any parts of the country or the world? That is where I do find hope because we will never be able to cut off the supply side because, as I said, you ingest a drug, it's gone, it's one-time use. You take advantage of a human, it could be hundreds or thousands. So we have to cut off the demand side because the supply side is always going to be there. With that hope, in 2023, we supported 700 collaborative rescue missions with law enforcement. 700, which might have ranged from one to 100. Those numbers are pretty amazing about how we can directly impact this. And that 700 collaborative rescue missions yielded the arrest of 2,200 suspected traffickers pedophiles, and would-be sex buyers. So it's not just the people that are trafficking that are the criminals. It's the people that might be a neighbor in a very affluent suburb that could be the buyer. Just people that you would never suspect. It are happens part of everywhere. It happens every everywhere. Every country, mm -hmm. every city, every suburb, every rural area, this mm -hmm. is happening. Yep. And so the eyes on it and the awareness of it, and that's what we are trying to do on the crisis files is not only prevent these kind of crises, but make us all more aware so that you and your teams and the law enforcement you work with have some kind of chance. One thing I would like to add about how you can help is we have attorneys who volunteer and donate their time pro bono, and we're actually going to create a whole Lawyers Against Trafficking unit because people are always offering their services. And it might mean like wiping away their records of sex crimes so that they can not be listed as a felon because they weren't a felon themselves, but helping them get restoration, restorative justice, and back on the pathway. There are ways that people support us near and far, whether it's coaches against trafficking and doing events. And one of the things that we do uniquely is repatriate the survivors. So we are the only organization that I'm aware of that has the resources if you were rescued in Mexico, but you're from Colombia, we will pay for your airfare and all of your expenses to get back home to your family and begin your survivor care there. Wow. Well, just so much that you have brought to us today. Thank you, Tammy, for the work you're doing and for educating us. Learn more at OurRescue.org. That's O-U-R, Rescue.org. Today's Crisis Brief brought to you by Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Number one, human trafficking happens everywhere. 
Anyone could be a perpetrator. Number two, look for the signs. Any relationship that looks unusual, even does a person have their own cell phone as they walk through an airport. Number three, report what you see to law enforcement. Support any organization that is trying to eradicate human trafficking. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber is a proud sponsor of the Crisis Files podcast. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber is the area's most active business advocacy organization, playing a critical role in top issues impacting the region, including workforce development, education, housing, and transportation. Make your voice heard by becoming a member of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Learn more at mplschamber.com or Google Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Rate, review, and subscribe to The Crisis Files on your platform of choice. Check out our website, thecrisisfiles.com, to catch up on all case files in one easy spot. Follow us on YouTube and Instagram at The Crisis Files. I'm Roshini Rajkumar. Join me next time on The Crisis Files.